and I hope there is plenty of sunshine in your soul. There is a uh, cold in my throat, so uh, forgive me if I appear to be rude today. I'm not shaking hands with anybody or hugging folks today. I don't want to give you what I might have. Uh, now, I'd love to give you all of Jesus. If you don't have him, I'll be happy to share him with you, but I don't want to share my cold. Uh, anyway, this is uh, this is the last Sunday of the month, and if you're new to New Hope, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you today. It's Hymn Sunday. We tend to emphasize hymns on the last Sunday of the month. We do hymns sometimes during the rest of the weeks, but uh, uh, certainly on this last Sunday, it's our time to kind of take a step back and remember those songs that encouraged us in our younger days. And so we hope you will enjoy our time together. You have a, a special today, a treat, um, a duet that they have never sung here before. And uh, so looking forward to hearing from them a little later on. But a great old song that I grew up uh, hearing called Farther Along. So I hope you'll enjoy that today. If you are visiting with us, there's some cards in the pew in front of you. It says Vista at the top. It's not happening with the uh, On the side of Vista, please fill it out. Put it in the offering bag when it comes by. Next week through the mail, we'll send you information about New Hope. Let you know what goes on around here. We promise we're not going to beat on your door and bother you on the phone. through the mail. Uh, give you the information we hope will be most helpful to you. Let me highlight a few announcements and then some prayer request updates besides what's already uh, in your bulletin. Um, first off, we have a young lady uh, who's in this service. Normally, when she is here, she is standing back there in the booth. She's normally assisting uh, with our channel. But we don't have a young lady back here today. But uh, where, where, it's, it's Amber. She's sitting right up here. Stand up, please. Amber, I understand that you just had a birthday this week. Is that correct? And it was a special birthday. You turned. Oh, look. Where did she go? She was so sweet. And which birthday milestone did you hit yesterday? 18. 18. All right. You guys happy birthday. Your parents are in our prayers. All right. Uh, you still live at home, right? Yeah. So, uh, honor your father and mother, so your days may be long up on the earth. <laughs> All right? And not abbreviated. Because, you know what Bill Cosby said, don't you? He said, I made you, so I can take you out of this world and make another one just like you. <laughs> so, alright. Happy birthday, darling. Uh, Thank you for all that you do back there. Uh, some announcements. Next week, uh, here at the church, 1045, if you have uh, uh, requested to be a member of New Hope, there's a class that's offered that will answer most of your questions. It's a two-week class. It starts next Sunday morning. Next Sunday is also a special day around the city of Clovis. It is the first weekend of April, which is kickoff for Rodeo Month. So it is Big Hat Weekend, and it is Roundup Weekend here at New Hope Church. You can get your best, finest Western apparel out and wear it to church all month if you would like. But particularly on the first Sunday and the last Sunday of the month, it's uh, certainly appropriate and adequate. You will not be alone if you do. Uh, and after the 1045 service, we have a barbecue that will be going on. Fresh barbecue hamburgers will be put together and assembled by your elder board. And they will serve you your hamburgers. And um, you can go and get your potato salads or your chips or your water. And... Um, we provide the hamburgers, and you all provide the other stuff, all right? So, many of you volunteer, uh, if you already signed up last week, you don't need to sign up again, but if you can bring any of the aforementioned salads or desserts or chips in individual bags or cakes with a bottle of water, just sign up to bring them so we have plenty for everybody. But this is just a great Sunday afternoon for us to have fellowship together. There's a few activities, a chili cook-off taking place. Uh, there's going to be a little line dance and instructions out there. There'll be some activities for the kids. But by and large, this is a day for us to sit and eat and get better acquainted with one another. So hope you come and join us for that next Sunday as we kick off Rodeo Month around the city of Clovis. Tonight, it's a very special time for New Hope Church. So uh, <coughs> this is where you need to pray. Yeah. <laughs> We're straight for tonight in the voice, all right? Uh, we get to play auctioneer tonight from 5.30 till about 7.30. You bring your best baked goods, your best home-cooked goods, from dessert to main courses. Bring them tonight, we are going to auction them off, all right? Um, we try to raise between ten dollars and $15,000. This is for our youth Mexico mission trip that will take place the week of Easter. 
and uh, we're going to be they're going to be putting a brand new makeover on a little church in a village outside of Rosarito, Mexico. And uh, we usually need to raise the funds to do that. It's between ten and fifteen thousand dollars. Help some of our kids who can't afford to go get there as well. So come out tonight, bring your goods, bring your checkbook, and we have fun. You don't have to stay the entire time. It only takes us an hour and a half to get this done, sometimes close to two hours. You can come for 30 minutes, you can come for 45, you can come at the beginning, you can come at the end. Um, I will tell you, you get the best choice when you come and stay through the whole thing. But you can come, spend what you have. Uh, there are things that will go for 20 bucks, and there are things that will go for uh, 1,000 bucks. Okay? I'm not kidding. All right? That happens. Um, don't take offense to what your stuff goes for. One year, maybe something goes big, another year it doesn't. You just never know. All right? Uh, but all of it goes into one pot and it all goes to the same thing. So come and join us tonight. Anything from cookies to, to lasagna you're going to find here. Uh, special Olympic sign up, that's also on that clipboard. I forgot to mention that. It's on the back page. If the lines are full, turn over and put your name on the back. Uh, that is on Friday before uh, the rodeo finals on Sunday. So this is Friday, April the 25th. And this is going to be Clovis North. John Wilhorn is our point man for that event. John has a real passion for special needs. Uh, he had a sister who was special needs, and so uh, John will be out there. If you don't know who John was, besides being the owner of Belmont Nursery, he was also an All-American Victory of Fresno State back in the day. Back in the day, he was back when I was a kid, all right? And uh, so anyway, John had a real heart for this, and uh, it's just a great experience to be out there cheering on those, uh, those young boys and girls, and some young men and women who have special needs, doing the very best they possibly can. It's a wonderful, rewarding experience. Would love to, for you to share it and to sign up. Uh, a few prayer requests. Uh, are not able to, first of all, Lenny, part of our small group, uh, had surgery this past Friday and uh, he didn't do well. Uh, the Jerry Brown family, just remember the only shade. Wow, you caught me off guard there, Jerry. All right, you cleaned up your act. Uh, anyway, lots of needs going on in Jerry's family, from his daughter to his brother to his, his own needs here, so just be praying for them. Steve, Steve Childress, uh, Steve and Lee, part of our church family. Uh, Steve was being a good Samaritan. Um, one of their neighbor's alarms went off, and uh, uh, several of the neighbors stood in the front yard, staring at the house, no, knowing that nobody was home. And they tried to figure out what to do. And Steve said, well, I'll, I'll jump over the fence while we're waiting for the alarm to come in, sniff and leave the back. Well, he was wearing flip-flops. And uh, I told him he really had to come up with a better story. Um, but it takes too long to tell you the three various stories that he did come up with. And some of them were rather creative, I must have. Uh, the real story is, again, again, vaulting the fence. His uh, back of his flip-flop hit the top of the fence. It acted as a runner and steered him off course. And instead of landing on his feet, he landed on his shoulder. He broke it in two places. And so tomorrow he will be having shoulder surgery at Fresno Community Hospital. Don't ask me where. It will be on his shoulder. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so be praying for Steve as he goes through that. Uh, Steve, um, Captain Powers, Dick Allen, and Flo, some of three seniors in our church, all having uh, various health challenges. So if you'd please remember them. And then continue to pray for the Kelly family and uh, how God works in their lives and the death of their 20-year-old niece. And then uh, just some kind of breaking news with our church family. And Mary Ann, is she here in the service? She's not here. <laughs> Um, Lisa's mom, uh, Marianne Ramirez, had a biopsy this past week and got the results on Friday. And the results are, are not the kind of results that she wants. She has a tumor on her pancreas. It has been diagnosed as a malignant cancer tumor. We do not know what type of cancer it is yet. We should not jump to a conclusion that just because it's attached to the pancreas, that is pancreatic cancer, that does not necessarily mean that. <coughs> And um, so there'll be further tests and some more discussions done. So please be praying for Lisa and their family and for Mama Marianne as they go through this process together, along with God's efficiency and our availability to them for encouraging them to hold. So please be praying for them. So those are the updates we wanted to bring to your attention. If you would join with us as we pray, um, we do have a special video today. This is connected to our Youth Mexico Mission Project. And the pie option tonight. Have you all noticed that the sanctuary is brighter today? Yes. Okay. There's good news and there's bad news. The 
good news is, uh, those are LED lights, and they can save us a lot of money, different kinds of bulbs. We get more power and more of them, so that's made it brighter in here, which is really kind of nice. The flip side of that is, it still gives us a hump in our sound system, so it did not solve the problem. So, we're still, and, and, and see, there you go, you just heard it. So, anyway, uh, we'll address that problem next week. Uh, but, it is brighter in here, so for that we are very grateful. And Carlos is giving us a real sample. Sorry, I'm afraid to fix it. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward and wait on us until we have our morning tide in here. They are coming. Our Father, we love you. Thank you for the rain last night. Thank you for the rain that's coming tomorrow and the next day. You know the needs of this valley, and so we simply trust you that we will be big enough to take a task. Father, the drought is what the state needs to get us to a point of prayer. And Father, hold me. And by prayer, others come to discover who you are. And Father, send the rain. But we know that you're big enough for whatever is necessary for this state. Father, we trust you with the needs that we've already shared and talked about today for Marianne. Lord, we, we pray for a real sense of peace in her heart. And as uh, she faces the uncertainty of the future, she knows that she has a certain future. And that certainty is found in Jesus Christ, not in the reports of the doctor, and not in what disease in this world can do to us. But Father, our future is certain to you. Lord, we trust you with the need of those who walk in here today and are facing some real challenges this week. I trust that when they walk out of the service because of the music that they have heard and the prayers they have shared and the way in which your word may speak to their hearts, that I trust they will leave here lighter than they arrived, that their burdens will be lifted, and that their load will be far lighter. Father, give us a, a strength and a mental acuity today that is beyond our own ability. Folks, folks walk away from here today and they'll say, we heard God speak to us today. Not that they heard a message from the family, but they heard a message from you. That is our heart's cry. For the privilege of giving and sharing, we say thanks. Your generosity overwhelms us. And your giving us a group people continues to meet the needs not only of the kingdom work here in the communities of Fresno and Columbus, but Father, you provide us the resources to be instrumental in your kingdom work literally around the world. For that privilege, we say thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs>
What was different about this trip was that I got to be in their culture and be um, living their lives almost in a, in a way because uh, it wasn't I wasn't in a nice hotel I wasn't in some you know rich place so to say I was you know in bunk beds and I mean well I had a bed and some people don't have beds but I got to experience the the life almost that they were living there and um, really brought me to their, their level and really opened my eyes to uh, I guess open my heart to them because I got a sense of what they're going to do. So it was kind of the same. I mean, every mission trip, you're going to learn something about yourself. God's going to teach you a lot, whether it's here in Fresno or whether it's across the world. After going on my first short term mission trip to Arizona and then on my second one to Mexico, uh, it did influence me to um, make a choice to go to South Africa for a year. Um, partially. It wasn't intentional. Uh, I had no idea I would be doing this. Uh, God has a way of surprising people sometimes. Both of those mission trips really, uh, I guess, gave me a more inside look on what it's going to be like. So therefore, I wasn't as afraid as just going my first time. For all those people who are wondering whether or not they should go to, you know, Mexico or whatever, the mission trip is this year. Um, I highly suggest that you go. Uh, I promise you that it will change your life. Uh, 
Here's the deal. The sermons are on tape, so if you guys want to go back and, and listen to it the week you're on the study, you can do that. But what we're trying to do is coincide the Sunday sermon with the lesson that you just completed. We'll do a better job of making sure everybody can get started on the same week next year. And uh, we won't have any same <coughs> weeks for the first the first time around. We'll all stay together. But uh, anyway, it's called Unstuck. It's a four-part uh, uh, film series that we are doing in our small groups. Um, and you guys are probably tired of hearing me talk about small groups because we've been talking about it for about six weeks. It's a huge deal. We're probably never going to stop talking about small groups. It's part of the DNA around New Hope from this day on. Um, it is through the access and the use of small groups that we uh, reach out to one another, we connect with each other, um, that we grow together in our relationship with Christ and our knowledge of His Word, and together we learn to serve each other. And we have seen those things happen over our first year of small groups. Just to put it in perspective, for the previous uh, for the previous 20 years at New Hope with Adult Sunday School, maybe our biggest Sunday with Adult Sunday School, we might have had 40 to 45 adults participate in Bible study together. Okay, that would be our biggest Sunday in 20 years of adults participating in Sunday School. In small groups. We have 220 plus adults meeting together every single week doing Bible study together. I want to do that too. That makes a huge difference. We also have people just completely omitting the pastor out of praying for people in the hospital and when they're sick because the small group is doing the job. Okay? It's okay. I'm over it now. <laughs> it's good. I am. Yeah, it's, it's good. It's good. It was in the last service. But. But um, it's, it's just phenomenal. If you're not in one, I wish you'd go, oh, I know you're too busy. I know that, all right? Um, all of us are. But I, just try it. Just, just try it. And you know what? You get put in a group you don't like or they don't like you, change groups. It is okay. It is okay. It's not, nobody's going to make a big deal about it, all right? We've got all kinds of groups. We've got groups that are put together by agents. We've got groups who don't want to be put together by agents. They want to they be with different Folks that are different than they are. We got folks with kids, folks without kids. We got folks who meet during the daytime. We got folks who meet at night. They're going on all times about it. I, I don't know if a group though meeting after midnight. Anybody meet after midnight? But, but we got groups meeting at all different times of the day. Some meet here at the church when it's available. Some meet in homes. Uh, some have done some Bible studies in the park. All right, your group kind of you've got some autonomy in those areas. But man, it's the way that you will. Connect and reach and grow and serve and get plugged in. And that is so very, very important to us here. We don't want you just to be, uh, just, just to come and be entertained. We want you to get engaged. And so in this series is called Unstuck. Uh, it's a four-week study. You see, it's easy for Christians to find themselves caught up in a life that's filled with cluttered schedules and rhythms and routines that are dictated by our culture and our systems. And many feel stuck in that routine of life. They go from job to home to school events filled with daily circumstances. They know this is not the life they dreamed of, and they feel stuck in a life, and they are yearning for a life that is filled with deeper meaning. This unstuck Bible study has been designed to get us out of the ruts and the pitfalls that often ensnare us. We have been inspired and we've been equipped with some pretty powerful biblical teachings. In our first two lessons by Francis Chan, and by Lisa Harper, and our next two lessons by Rich Stearns and Mark Patterson. Each of these teachers are drawing from the lessons from an award-winning movie called The Journey to Jamaa. All right. We get little eight to ten minute snippets. It's kind of like a soap opera each week. It's a story about two kids who are forced to search for hope in a broken world. As we have looked at these four powerful lessons, up to this point we've covered session one, which was entitled Unimaginable, and we look at the sweet fruit of bitter times. When our life is filled with trouble and trials and tragedies, what should our perspective be? And we were taken to the book of James, chapter one, verses one through eight, and we discovered four essentials for having victory in times of trial and difficulty. We saw how we were to count, to know, to let, and to ask. Count it all. Joy. Joy. When you are confronted with trials and difficulties of many kinds. Not if you are confronted, but when you are. Because if you haven't had them yet, just wait. They're coming. And so have an attitude before they ever arrive that is filled with joy. 
Number two, have an understanding mind. Know the truths of the scripture before the troubles come. Three, let, have a surrendered will so God can accomplish his purposes in the midst of your problems. And number four, ask, a heart that wants to believe that God is sufficient. And we spent a great deal of time unpacking all that. Last week we looked at, at, at lesson number two, entitled Unsafe. That we live in a dangerous world and there's someone who is looking out to destroy us. And his name is Thanks. Satan, the devil, Lucifer, Belzebub, whatever name you want to call him. He is out there looking to destroy us. And we've got to handle a little bit of on who he is and what he's like and how he behaves. We look at the problems with shortcuts. The devil doesn't show up as a roaring lion, though that is his intent, his destruction. He's cunning and he's crafty. And he looks for sneaky ways to get us to take shortcuts, as he did with the two kids in the movie The Job Out. He makes us big promises on the front end, and they're empty when you get to the end. So watch out. We need to identify our snakes, those things that are tempting to us, and we've got to stop playing with them. Today, we're going to look at the third subject, which is called unwanted. And we are going to investigate the fears and the feelings of rejection, of not being wanted by those that we want to want us. The dynamic combination of the film, the profound biblical teaching, the powerful real-life stories and sermons, I trust are helping our groups get unstuck and focused on a life of purpose that God intends for us. On the last Sunday of April, after the rodeo finals are over, at about 6 or six or 6.30, Gloria, why don't we decide? Okay, between now and then we'll decide, all right? It'll be 6 or 6.30, uh, let's say 6.30, let's say 6.30, we'll just make that decision now. At 6.30, we're going to show the movie, we're going to show the movie Journey to Jamaa on the big screen, all right? So all you small groups, we can all come and we'll get to see it in its entirety, not just snippets, but from beginning to end in one movie. Those of you not in a small group, you can come, all right? And uh, we're going to watch the entire movie. It's only about a 45 to four, uh, 49 minute movie, I think, in its entirety. And we will watch it together. And so whether you're in a small group or not, maybe this will encourage you to join one. But we can all watch it together. Powerful, true story, all right, of this little boy and this little girl. And, uh, and then Corey is going to make a, a, a presentation at the end of that. She is now a, a trained representative for World Vision. <coughs> All right, and uh, World Vision is the one who produced the movie Journey to Jaman, and she's going to tell us how we might be able to make a difference in the lives of young children, just like uh, uh, the brother and sister in the movie of Journey to Jaman. Today, we're going to look at the fears and the feelings of rejection. What are us Americans afraid of? The answers change drastically. After 9-1-1. Before 9-1-1, terrorism did not show up as a fear at all in any of the list of Americans. After 9-1-1, terrorism went to number one on the list of what people are most afraid of. So, I'm taking terrorism out of the equation for today. Here's the top 14 fears of Americans with terrorism out of the picture. Number one. Speaking in front of a crowd. <laughs> How many of you are scared you have to speak in front of a crowd? Okay, right there with you. <laughs> Number two, heights. Heights. How many of you are afraid of heights? <laughs> We're glad that Jimmy's not because when he's not singing, he's climbing power poles. All right. Uh, Number three, insects and bugs. How many of you are afraid of insects and bugs? Okay, yeah. See, I suggest Ray works really good. Number four, financial problems. Don't like them. Hate them. Number five, how about deep water? Okay. It's why I don't swim in an ocean. Things move faster in the water than I do. About everything moves faster in the water than I do. Sickness. Sickness. I'll be afraid of sickness. <laughs> Death. Yeah. Probably, in reality, that probably will move up apart from terrorism to number one. How about dogs? 
Afraid of dogs? Got two hands. Okay, let me qualify that. Pit bulls. <laughs> okay, all right, tanky a little bit. Um, this one, this one's surprising. Loneliness. Afraid of loneliness. Uh, number 11, driving or riding in a car? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Depends on who's driving. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, darkness. You're afraid of the dark. Okay, got a few hands. How come almost all of you who didn't raise your hands have nightlights in your house? <laughs> uh, elevators. Great elevators. A couple of okay. How about escalators? Janice, okay, good. Okay, mother back there. Yeah. Always at the mall, the Roland family always had to go away to the elevator for Janice to come up while everybody else got the escalators. <laughs> the folks here is not that. Yeah. Beer is not all. I, I'm just preparing for a shopping trip. Fear, fear is not always bad. There are times of fear that God given emotion that prepares our body and our mind to deal with the challenges of life. There's nothing wrong with having fear in most instances. In fact, it can often be a very healthy emotion to have. It's one that can keep us alive. The adrenaline prepares our body to deal with possible battle or flight and danger. With fear comes the ability to do far more than we ever dreamed or expected that we thought was possible by us. I read a story several years ago about four guys in a jeep in a jungle trail in Vietnam. All was well until they were suddenly under fire from the Viet Cong. Bullets were flying all around them from every direction. The driver tried frantically to turn the jeep around, but the, the, the road was just too narrow, and for some reason he didn't think about just going in reverse. The driver yelled for everybody to jump out and grab a corner of the Jeep. They did. They physically lifted the Jeep off the ground, turned it around in the space of a few seconds. The task accomplished. They jumped with the Jeep and they got out of harm's way. When they arrived back at their base camp, wide-eyed and filled with a mixture of excitement and fear, they told their unbelieving buddies the story of what had just happened. When challenged as to the veracity of their story, they said, we'll prove it to you. All four guys went out to the Jeep, each one of them grabbed a corner, and they couldn't lift it off the ground. <laughs> See, that's the power that's motivated sometimes by fear. But fear uncontrolled can be very destructive in our lives. Dr. Walter Cannon, a pioneer researcher in psychosomatic medicine at Harvard University, describes what happens to the human body when it becomes angry or fearful. One, respiration deepens. Two, the heart beats more rapidly. Three, the arterial pressure rises. Four, blood is shifted from the stomach and the intestines to the heart and the central nervous system and the muscles. Five, the process of something I can't pronounce ceases. Six, sugar is freed from the reserves in our liver. Seven, the spleen contracts and discharges its contents of concentrated corpuscles and adrenaline is secreted. And I got a feeling we don't want to hold any of that in or it would make us sick. You see, fear, fear paralyzes, it tortures, it destroys, and it also debilitates. And today, the fear that is just as paralyzing as any of the others, and the fear that is universally felt, is the fear of rejection and of being unwanted. How many of you would say that you have a fear of being unwanted? I suggest to you that those who didn't raise your hand, you have been hurt so badly by others in the past that you have created the shield around you. And you say you don't care if you're unwanted or rejected. And that probably is the best protection from fear of being unwanted and rejected. Derek, Derek and Margaret are the two kids in the movie The Journey to Jama. After the death of their mother, they built a large wooden box. Margaret stole the skateboard wheels from the girl that didn't like her very well, and they put those skateboard wheels on the bottom of the box. They put what few belongings along with their dead mother's body in the box. They keep a promise that they had made to their mother that they would go to their auntie's house, about 40 miles away. Rough road, 
lots of dangers, very <coughs> hilly path to take, very difficult for two small children. After escaping the clutches of an evil man who hid behind a beautiful smile, who offered them a shortcut that would have ended up with empty promises. After a hard, laborious trip of struggles, they finally arrived at Andy's home. Destination arrived, Mama Barrett, mission accomplished. New home, new family, find the same. Margaret and Jerry, for the first time in weeks, lay down in the bed with family. They're not afraid. They're not under the light of the bar somewhere. They're not out on the side of the street somewhere. They're not in the jungle alone somewhere. They've arrived at Andy's home. But Derek is awakened by the shouts of his uncle as he yells at his auntie that he can barely afford to feed the family he has, much less two more mouths. Derek goes and he wakes up his little sister and he tells her we must leave. We are not wanted here. Rejected and unwanted. Disappointment and rejection produces pain in our life. When you and I experience this kind of pain, we tend to lose our perspective. It often shakes our faith in God. And if we make important decisions at that moment, we end up with wrong and misguided priorities. That's why we need to remember the wise words of the song that was sung to us a little bit ago. Walk in the sunshine. Farther along, we'll understand it. How many of you remember seeing the movie Back to the Future? Yeah, that was good. Re remember Marty, what was his last name? Fly. <laughs> good job, you guys did see the movie. Marty McFly goes back in time to the year 1955. Now, I gotta tell you folks, that's not that far back in time. <laughs> I was born already, not that far back. But Marty goes back to make sure that his mom falls in love with his dad. And there's a scene where Marty tries to get his dad to ask her out, and his dad says, you mean on a date? Marty says, yeah. And his dad says, gee, I don't know, Marty. I, I, I mean, what if she says no? Well, what if she laughs at me? I, I just don't think I can handle that kind of rejection. You know what I mean? Marty hangs his head and he says, yeah, I know what you mean. And I believe you know what it means to experience that kind of rejection. I think we can all resonate with that. I mean, as humans, we hate being rejected in any form. And the reason we hate it is because it hurts. And it hurts in a place where we can't put alcohol or mercurochrome on it. You remember that stuff? Remember how badly it stained everything, you know? Never were to touch the bottle, and yet it was your daddy would say, as soon as you got a scratch or something, something let's put a little bit of pure on it. It'll make it feel better. <laughs> I hate that stuff. <laughs> but we can't put a band aid on rejection. Whether it's on the playground at recess or in school growing up, asking for a date on the prom or asking for someone to hand the marriage, maybe it's on the job, or maybe it's from your spouse or a child. For church. I'll tell you maybe my biggest rejection. I was 20, uh, I was 22 years old. I worked in Nashville, Tennessee during the summer. I, it was my fifth year heading up National Youth Convention. The convention was in Detroit, Michigan that year. And, uh, it was the day before the big convention was to start. And just leaders and coordinators were there early. And, and I walked to a restaurant, and there was a guy I'd known for a long time. He lived in Nashville, and there was this gorgeous girl sitting in the booth with him. And I knew it was too old to be his daughter and too young to be his wife. And there was nobody else there, and so I thought, wow. So I just kind of popped in to visit with my friends, <laughs> waiting for an introduction, and they introduced me, and I found out she was single and available. And actually, during this week of conference, we had three kind of like coffee dates there. Oh, it was going great. 
found out she lived in Nashville. And I wondered, wow, why did two months go by? I lived in Nashville for nearly two months. Two months wasted. I was going to be back in Nashville for a week after the convention. And, oh, she had me over for dinner and met the parents. Oh, it was good. Saw her again in, in, uh, in September. I had to fly back to Nashville. And saw her again. Things were going great. And I think this, this, may, this may really lead somewhere. Starting to get that stage in life, starting to think about marriage. So I come back again in, uh, in February for a pop in trip. I stayed at the Fry's house when I was in town. That's who I worked for. And they had a, a, their oldest son was a couple of years younger than me, but I, I, I shared a room with him in the basement. And uh, so I got, they picked me up at the airport and I got my stuff unloaded. And they said, What do you want to do first? And I said, I want to give. This world, I can't remember her name. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was Kathleen, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I did not take rejection well. <laughs> but, but, but I said, I, I want to call Kathleen. And, and, and that goes, great. And I expected him to kind of leave the room. He just pops down, got this funny smile. I should have known something was up. And so I dialed the number, and no answer. The phone's been disconnected. So, oh, no problem. I got a parent's phone number, so I call the parents. Get mom on the phone. I said, hey, this is uh, Tim. I was trying to get a hold of Kathleen, but her number's been disconnected. I thought maybe I could get her current number from you. And she said, oh, yeah, Tim, I'll be happy to get that for you. And she said, uh, Tim, you did hear that she got married, didn't you? <laughs> I lied. I said, oh, yeah, I just wanted to call and congratulate her. And I lied and my heart sunk. Unwanted. I survived. <laughs> you do, but don't. It hurts. In whatever form it comes. And guys, it can also happen at church. It's a good time for the story. We need proper etiquette in church. Us regular church folks, we need some proper etiquette. We have a family at our church. I would not point them out. I'm not even going to tell you what service they were a part of. It's amazing that they are still here. It's amazing they became part of the church. They have. They, they have big skin, but others wouldn't have done this. Others would have just left because they would have felt rejected and unwanted. They came one Sunday and they came to sit on the pew, and as they got ready to sit down, they were told by somebody, You can't sit there. Other people sit there. <laughs> so they moved. They came back the next Sunday and they came in. They made sure that they didn't sit in that place where other people sit. And they sat down and they put their stuff down. And then they needed to go to the restroom. And so they went to the restroom. When they came back, their stuff had been moved. Not one pew, not two pews, but three pews forward. <laughs> they come back a third time. And they sit down, and somebody behind them says, I'm sorry, but I can't see around you. You need to move over. <laughs> you guys get the picture? All well, all, whoever, all, all well mean we all like to sit. We, we kind of get our seats. We kind of get our spots. You guys, we have no idea. The person who's coming in, it's their first Sunday. We have no idea if they know Jesus or not. We have no idea what hurts that brought them here that day. And all of a sudden, we get unwanted. Un we, 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 not here. Rejected. Mm. Gotta be careful. Gotta be cautious. Because hurt often can lead to disaster. It's a downward spiral. Wherever it comes from, we can all agree that that hurt like this, rejection damages, it bruises our egos. I'd be willing to bet that this is an emotion that we can all agree we would like to live the rest of our life without. We know what the feeling is like of not getting the call, not getting the job, not getting accepted to the school that we wanted to go to or invited to be part of the club. We have phrases like, I was left holding the bag, I was left standing at the altar, I was left out in the cold. How about, how about David? First Samuel 16, he was left out of the pasture, tending the sheep. 
His story did not begin on the battlefield of Goliath, but started on the hillsides of Bethlehem, watching his father's sheep as the silver-haired prophet of Israel comes down a narrow trail. Samuel is God's chosen priest, prophet, and judge of Israel. His mother is Hannah. He was mentored by Eli. And when Eli's son turned from God, Samuel steps up. When Israel needed spiritual focus, Samuel provided it. And when Israel wanted a king, Saul anointed him. Tall Saul. Strong Saul. He was picked by the people. Why? Because they wanted to be like other nations. They weren't content to let God in heaven be their king. They wanted a king like earthbound nations. They wanted a king they could see. They wanted a king they could touch. They wanted a king they could hide behind. So who did they choose? They chose the Tim Belchers of Israel. Okay? They chose the six foot six, six foot seven. They chose the guy who stood taller, head and shoulders above everybody else. God rejected Saul because Saul rejected God. Saul had gone mad and his heart had gone hard. He isn't the king he once was. And in God's eyes, he is not king of Israel anymore. And that brings us to 1 Samuel 16. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil. What is oil a picture of in the Bible? The Holy Spirit. Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. Is that not what Jesus said to the disciples? Go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How do we go when God sends us? In the power and the influence of the Holy Spirit. That is how we go, no other way. Samuel, go with the Holy Spirit under the influence of God. Go. It's the only way we can go. It's the reason that David could go to Goliath. Weeks or months later, he could go how? Because he went with the presence of the Holy Spirit. But Samuel said, how can I go? Saul will hear about him and kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer. Now, you all know what a heifer is? Okay, if you're not a country person, you might not know. All right, that's a cow. That's a good, strong, sturdy cow. All right? Um, uh, where's two cows? She in here this morning? Where's two cows? <laughs> Katie Cole, that's her new nickname around here. Because they told she was told in Africa she would be worth two cows in the village. Right. Her new nickname is Two Cows. <laughs> you tell them I've come to sacrifice to the Lord and my gesture to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said, and when he arrived at Bethlehem with the heifer in tow, the elders of the town trembled when they met him and they asked, Can you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. And then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. And when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab, the firstborn of Jesse, and he said, Surely the Lord's anointing stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things the way man does. Man looks at outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. He's looking for a heart that will let him be God. Then Jesse called him in and Ab and had a pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by Samuel. He said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So we asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? One, no, two, no, three, no, four, no, five, no, six, no, seven, no. You see, Jesse didn't even think his youngest son should have even been in the lineup. <coughs> You talked about rejected. Yeah, all seven brothers were told no, but what about David? Out in the field, can't even hang with the family. Can't even be in the running. Not even considered. Are these all your sons? There was still the youngest, Jesse answered. The baby. He's tending sheep. 
Somebody said, sit for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. Why? Because <laughs> you don't sit when the king's coming. You stand. You will not sit down until he arrives. So he went and had him brought in. He was ruddy with a fine appearance. Ruddy means he probably ran. <laughs> Red faced. Fine appearance. Handsome features. The Lord said, rise and anoint him. He's the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. And Samuel then went to Ramah. Israel of 1000 B.C. was in a bad way. Joshua and Moses are history class heroes. Israel had gone through about 3,000 years of a spiritual winter. The faith of the people was frozen. In those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did as he saw fit in his own eyes. Sounds a lot like the 21st century, doesn't it? God is a loving, kind, and gracious God, so I can do whatever is right in my own eyes, and it will be okay because he loves me. Corruption, fuel, disruption, immorality, sire, brutality. The people wanted a king instead of saving the ship. Saul sunk it. The Philistines were warring. They were bloodthirsty, breathing people who monopolized iron and blacksmithing. They were the grizzly bears of the Israelites with the fish in the stream. There was corruption from within and danger from without. Saul was weak, but the nation was weaker yet. What would God do? He did what nobody even imagined. He issued a surprise invitation to a nobody from nowhere's bill. You ever felt like that? You ever felt like you were a nobody? Living nowhere? You're just the person God is looking for. He's looking for you. Sometimes this happens in church. Sometimes dissension occurs. Anger gets, gets to where it crops up. People cry for a new pastor. He just doesn't inspire me anymore. He's just not feeding us anymore. He, he kind of stuck in the old ways. Or, or he's trying to change everything. Find somebody new. There are a dime a dozen. So God sent Samuel to Red Eye, Minnesota. Or Sawgrass, Mississippi. Or maybe Pawpaw, West Virginia. Or maybe Bibble, Oklahoma. You see, that's what Bethlehem was in those days. It was a red eye, Sawgrass, Pawpaw, or Dibble. Bethlehem was a sleepy village in the foothills of Israel. Sits about 2,000 feet above the Mediterranean, looking down on gentle green hills that flatten out for pasture lands outside of Jerusalem. Jesus issued the first cry beneath the Bethlehem sky. But about a thousand years before there would be that special babe in the manger, Samuel, pulling a heifer along, he enters the village of Bethlehem. His visits turn heads. Prophets don't normally come to Bethlehem. He stops at the house of Jesse. People are wondering, why would this man of distinction stop at Jesse's house? Some of you might be wondering, well, why wouldn't he stop at Jesse's house? Do you all remember who his grandmother and great-grandmother were? Grandmother was Ruth, a Moabite woman. His great-grandmother was Rahab, the hooker from Jericho. I mean, why in the world would he stop at that house? What happens next is like the Westminster Kettle Club. Any of you ever watch that when it's on TV? Oh, I do, I do. Especially if there's a Springer Spaniel or a German short hair in the finals, all right? By the way, just a small footnote, you realize the English Springer Spaniel has won that championship more than any other breed. Just thought I'd tell you that. I had two of them. Not two champions, just two Springer Spaniels. Samuel examines each of the sons of Jesse like the judges at the kennel club. He examined the would-be champions. More than once, Samuel is ready to award the blue ribbon, but God stops him. Sometimes churches go through this when looking for a preacher. They line them up. They give them the ones over. They kick the tires. It's kind of like buying a new car. Eliab, the oldest logical choice. The village Casanova, wavy hair, strong features. He had that keyboard smile. Wrong. Abinadab shows up. He's the GQ model, Italian suit, alligator shoes, jet black, classy, classy king with all the bling bling. Wrong. How about Shama? Oh, he's the studious bookworm. He could use a charisma transplant. He has a degree from the university, postgrad from Egypt, doctorate from Greece, maybe. Jesse tells Samuel, valedictorian everywhere he goes. Samuel's impressed, but God tells Samuel, wrong, not him. I do not look at a person's outward appearance. I'm looking at heart. 
Seven suns pass, seven suns fail. Don't you have another? Such a question would make Cinderella's stepmom squirm. <laughs> Jesse likely squirm as well. He said, yeah, I, I, I do have one more. I'm, I'm not sure you're all that interested. He's the baby. He, he's not taking care of the sheep. I mean, after all, isn't that what babies are for? They're to take care of the sheep. You see, this, this word, youngest, it carries with it more than just age. It, it really carries with it the weight of rank in the family. Really, what Jesse is saying, uh, there's one little brother left, and he's the run of the litter. Yeah. He's the baby. David was looked at by his family as the hobbit. <laughs> the run, the last pick. Yet you realize there are 66 chapters in the Bible dedicated to the story of this runt? Do you realize that God pays this runt the highest compliment that's been paid in all of Scripture when he says about David, he is a man after my own heart? Do you realize next to the words of Jesus, the most quoted passage of Scripture are those that were written by the discard? by the one left in the pasture. What caused God to take him? All of us have walked David's pasture, the pasture of rejection and exclusion. We've been evaluated by our physique and the square footage of our home, by the color and complexion of our skin, by the size of our office, by the presence of how many diplomas hang on a wall, by the charisma of our character, by the dimples on our cheeks, and so on. Are we tired of the Madison Avenue image? Are we tired of the games? Hard work is ignored. Devotion is unrewarded. The boss uses cleavage over character. The teacher picks pet students instead of the prepared ones. Parents show off their favorite sons and leave the runs out in the field. Oh, the giant of rejection is students. Mike Giacomelli tells about a boy walking by a pet store on his way to school. The young boy stopped and stared through the window. Inside were four black lab puppies all playing together. After school, he runs home and he's cleaning the mud. Let a puppy. Oh, I'll take care of it, Mommy. I'll, I'll clean up after it every day. Any of you ever do that with your parents? You made all the promises. You did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kept so few of them. Finally, the mother relents and gives him the okay to buy the puppy. After determining that the boy had enough money, the pet owner took the boy to the window and said, pick out your puppy in the window. After watching the puppy for a few more minutes, the boy, the boy said, I'll take that one. And he pointed to the one in the corner alone. Oh no, son, the pet owner said, I, I don't think you want that one. There's something wrong with him, he's, he's crippled. You notice how he just sits there. One of his back legs just doesn't work right. He can't run and keep up with the rest of it. Choose another one. Without saying a word, the boy reached down and he pulled up his pants leg and he showed the metal chrome of a brace that would be a permanent fixture on his leg for the rest of his life. And he said, no, sir. I'll take that puppy in the corner. You see, it turned out that what disqualifies the puppy from being chosen by others is what most qualified him to be chosen by the boy. Think about that for a moment. It's amazing how few of us believe in the unqualified grace of God. Oh, God loves us. God loves us, we think, as long as we are clean, as long as we are whole, as long as we are fixed, as long as we've got it together. But guys, do you understand this grace of God? It turns out that what disqualifies you and me from spirituality, the mess of our lives and our crippledness, it is what most qualifies us to be chosen by Jesus Christ. The woman at the well? The woman with the issue of blood? The leper? The fisherman? <clears throat> that which most of the world, the tax collector? That which disqualified most from society is the ones who responded so well to the invitation of Jesus. Welcome to a land of misfits when you are welcome to God's family. 
Again, I remind you, God wants to meet us right where we are today. God has not given up on you or you or you or you or me. God runs to find the prodigals. He runs to welcome us home. Look at the rejects that God has used throughout his history. Moses ran from justice and God used him. Jonah ran in disobedience from God as God still used him to bring revival to Nineveh. Rahab ran a brothel, and what better place could God have used her than to hide his spies? Samson ran to the arms of the wrong woman, and God used those arms of Samson to bring down a nation called Philistine. Elijah ran to the mountains from Jezebel. Daniel was cast into prison with lions. Ezekiel was half crazy, and Hosea married a prostitute. Matthew was a tax collector, and Peter was fickle, and John had a temper, and Paul was a murderer, and Jesus was from Nazareth. God used them all. God will use you, 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 me, no matter how checkered and misfitted our past may be. Like that little boy, God looks down and says to the runt, to the hobbit, to the rejected, I want you. Today he looks down from heaven and he sees you and he sees me with all my faults and sins. I want you. I want you. Rearview faith, folks, looking at all these characters, that's easy. That's easy to have faith. Yeah, look what God did in them, but now, now have, have front window faith and say, what he did in them, he can do in me. And go. Go to the Sunday school class over there that needs a teacher. Get up here in the choir where they need some more voices for Easter. Go across the street to your neighbor and say, hey, how about coming to church with me? Sit down with your son or your daughter and say, I can't bear the thought that when I die and go to heaven, I might not see you there with me. Go. Faith in the front window, not just in the rear view there. Let me close with this. John Todd was born in Rutledge, Vermont, into a family of many, many children. They later moved to the village of Kensington back in the 1800s, and there, at a very young age, both of John's parents died. The relatives wondered what they would do with so many children, how they could parcel them out to friends and relatives. One dear and loving aunt said she would take little John. The aunt sent a horse and a slave to pick John up. He was only six. The slave's name was Caesar. He came and put the little boy on the back of his horse. On the ride back, an endearing conversation took place. It goes like this. John asked, Will she be there? Caesar said, Oh, yes. Man will be waiting for you. Well, I like her! My son, you have fallen into the best of us. Well, I have my own room. Will she let me have a puppy? <laughs> She's got everything all set, son. I think she has some surprises, too. Do you think she'll go to bed before I get there? Oh, no, son. Oh, no. This woman, she will wait up for you. You will see her when we get out of these woods. You will see her candle shining in the window. When they got to the clearing, sure enough, there was a candle in the window, and Auntie was standing in the doorway. She reached down, and she picked him up, and she kissed him, and she said, Welcome home, John. And she fed him supper, and she took him to his room, and she sat on the side of the bed and caressed his hair until he fell asleep. John Todd grew to be a great preacher of the gospel. It was there in his auntie's house, the home of his new mother, that he grew up. It was always a place of enchantment because of his auntie. It awed him that she had given him a second chance, a second home. Years later, long after he moved away, his aunt wrote to him to tell him of her impending death. Her health was failing rapidly, and she wondered what was to become of her. And here is what her nephew, adopted son, John Todd, wrote. My dear auntie, years ago I left the house of death, not knowing where I was. To go to whether anyone cared, I did not know if it would be the end of me. The ride was long, but your slave encouraged me. And finally he pointed out your candle in the window to me. And there you were in the yard. You embraced me and you took me by the hand. You took me into your home and it became our home. You acted as if I was expected. 
I felt safe in the room, so welcome. It was my room. Now, Auntie, it is your turn to go. And as one who has tried it out, I'm writing to let you know that someone is waiting up for you. Your room is ready. The light is on. The door is open. And as you ride into that yard, dear Auntie, don't worry. You're expected. I know. For I once saw God standing in your doorway. Or somebody who needs to see God in you because that will be their doorway. <clears throat> we are not rejected by Jesus. He's looking for misfits just like us. Our Father, you know our needs today. You know the prayer of surrender that needs to slip from our lips today. Oh God, here is my heart. Let it be your heart. Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.